I'm Ken Binmuller from San Francisco. Endoscopic management of gastric varices, no disclosures. Gastric varices, a very heterogeneous group. The serine classification, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, differentiates four types, junctional, GOV1, junctional and fundic, GOV2, fundic, isolated, IGV1, isolated gastric varices, and ectopic IGV2. These junctional varices, which are an extension of esophageal varices into the stomach along those for curvature, comprise three quarters of all gastric varices. Then we have the junctional varices that extend to the fundus, so junctional and fundic, 16%, isolated fundic, 8%, and relatively rare, 2%, ectopic varices. But if we look at the fundic and the combined junctional and fundic, fundic varices comprise only one quarter of gastric varices. This differentiation of junctional from fundic varices is very important because they differ in their morphology, in their pathophysiology, in their natural history, in their response to treatment. Size-wise, fundic varices are very large, junctional varices more narrow and ropey, morphology, junctional, these ropey, like esophageal varices, tortuous, this is the description by Hajizomi, uh, fundic tumorous, grape-like. The blood flow in these larger fundic varices is very rapid and less so in the junctional varices. The location is submucosa for fundic varices, lamina propria, so much more superficial for junctional. And the HPVG is always significantly elevated for junctional varices versus fundic varices where it can be normal or just mildly elevated. And these fundic varices bleed at a much lower HPVG. And so in this study from D'Amico, 18 was the average for fundic and the HPVG was much higher at 24 for junctional. Junctional and fundic varices also differ in their blood supply and drainage. So junctional varices, these are supplied by the left gastric or the coronary vein shown here, and they drain to the atzygous vein. Fundic varices by contrast are supplied by the short gastric veins shown here. Now these are to the left of the left gastric vein and these drain to the IVC via gastrorenal shunts. There's very high flow in these gastrorenal shunts. So the drainage of fundic varices shown here is via gastrorenal shunts to the renal vein, the left renal vein to the IVC. And on an angiogram, you see this also very nicely. And it shows you just how large these shunts can be connecting to the renal vein and then to the IVC, and then of course the right atrium up here. The radiologists have come up with a classification which emphasizes the role of the gastrorenal shunt. So they differentiate between a type B versus the type A. So the classification is similar to the serine. There are just three types here, but the GOV1 are those without or the B type with gastrorenal varices. IGV-1, isolated fundic varices without gastrorenal shunt, those are rare, very rare, probably just 10% or so. And then those with the gastrorenal shunt. And then the GOV-2, so here you have junctional varices and fundic varices, again, with the gastrorenal shunt shown here, type B. And why this differentiation? Because for the radiologists who perform BERTO, alone included retrograde transvenous obliteration, this gastrorenal shunt is their target to obliterate gastric varices. They have to occlude this shunt, otherwise their obliterating agent, whether it's a sclerosin or glue or coils or gel, various plugs, 
they use a large arsenal of various embolizing agents, and they have to include this to prevent systemic migration. The gastrorenal shunt is, in fact, a natural portal systemic decompressive shunt. In a way, it's the body's way of trying to protect the liver. When we perform Berto, we block that gastrorenal shunt effect, which will worsen portal hypertension and either create or worsen ascites. And it will worsen esophageal varices or create esophageal varices and increase the bleeding risk. Now, the advantage of Berto, apart from obliterating gastric varices, of course, is that it will improve encephalopathy. Cyanoacrylate glue, the radiologists were using this long before we started to use it. And this was first reported by my mentor, Nibs Sahendra, in 1986. Uh, this is a monomer and it polymerizes as soon as it comes in contact with an ionic medium like uh, blood. So you can see that within seconds, it polymerizes and it forms a rock hard substance that plugs up the varix lumen. And historically, we have been performing this in retroflexion, looking back at the fundus. This glue plug is can be well seen on x-ray if we mix it with a contrast agent like lapidol. Here on histology, it is plugging up the lumen, this like concrete, and a cast of the varix is sometimes extruded. The dreaded complication, though, is that this glue can migrate, can embolize. So its intended use is folk or local embolization, but we don't want it to embolize systemically. And it can go anywhere in the body. And if you have AV shunts, well, it can get to the brain, for example, and cause a stroke. And those of us that have been performing glue injection for a while, we have seen these complications. It's underreported, but here a compilation of 27 reports, 11 organ infarctions, seven deaths from systemic embolization or migration. So we've been thinking about strategies. We endoscopists treating gastric varices, how can we reduce and ideally eliminate this risk of systemic embolization? So various strategies have been proposed. The uh, Seville group uh, targeted the perforating feeder vessel under EOS guidance. So this is the first application really of using EOS to target the feeder vessel and very nice proof of concept with obliteration of these uh, varices with no further bleeding. Now, the goal here is to reduce the amount of glue that is injected to reduce the risk of embolization. Same group reported on just eliminating the glue altogether and just using coils to treat gastric varices. Nice proof of concept as well. These coils, of course, have also been used by the radiologists. We're just borrowing their technology but a mean of nine coils were required per patient, up to 22 coils. So obviously this is quite costly and uh, labor intensive. This is a multi-center, a European multi-center trial of 30 patients, retrospective, non-randomized, but comparing EOS guided coil versus uh, EOS guided glue therapy. So both EOS guided, and targeting the feeder vessel in both groups. But what differed was the substance. So here, just glue. This was in two thirds of the patients targeting feeder vessel. And the other group, just coils, only coils, no glue in the other third. Now, what's interesting is that lung emboli were seen in nearly 50%, half of the patients who received the glue, despite targeting the feeder vessel. Using coils, none of these patients had evidence of lung emboli. Now, it could be the fact that we're using coils, but in 18% of these patients, glue still needed to be injected to obliterate the varices. And none of these patients uh, had lung emboli on their CT scans. So it raises the question whether maybe the coil placed before glue injection could prevent embolization. And this uh, coil, uh, firstly, 
has in the, an obliterating effect in that it fills and reduces flow in the pharynx. So now we've reduced flow, and now we then afterwards inject the glue. And because the flow is reduced, there's a higher likelihood that the glue will stay on site. And it will attach to these woolly strands that serve as a scaffold to retain the glue at the site of injection. This is just a ex vivo proof of concept that I did. So you can see this jar here filled with heparinized blood. And I first uh, placed the coil, then I injected the glue. And you can see that the glue is attached to the coils. And there was no glue left in the container itself. Uh, so at least it raises the possibility that this coil alone can prevent embolization. And we reported on our results back in 2011. So it's uh, it's now over a decade ago, but these are just images showing how we target the bundle varices under US guidance. Uh, we, we're, take, we're using a transesophageal, even transcrural sometimes approach, and then first deploying the coil, then injecting the glue, it's very echogenic, and we get a total whiteout of what was previously an anechoic structure. And then on follow-up, you can see the varices eradicated also endoscopically. So we verify the treatment success, the obliteration of the varices, both endoscopically and with EUS. Different studies are looking at different strategies for EUS-guided treatment and comparing them with direct endoscopic glue treatment, just using glue alone versus using coil and glue, and also comparing the different strategies for EUS-guided treatment. So let's review these very quickly. This is a historic comparison of EUS-guided glue versus endoscopic glue. Uh, this is from Indiana University and uh, retrospective 40 patients. Now, EUS-guided treatment was found to be superior in that less glue was required to obliterate the varices. This was statistically highly significant. There was a lower rate of gastric variceal bleeding, also uh, statistically significant, and a lower rate of non-gastric variceal uh, re-bleeding, also statistically significant with a similar rate of adverse events. This is a randomized controlled trial from Brazil comparing EOS guided coil and glue versus endoscopic glue alone. A pilot study, 32 uh, patients. And this study showed basically equivalent results in terms of glue obliteration of varices, whether injected EOS guided with addition of coil versus just glue endoscopic. Uh, but the embolization rate by CT scans was half that in the EOS guided group compared to the endoscopic guided group. This did not reach statistical significance, but then this is really a very small study. So I think this is probably a type two error. We have another randomized controlled trial, EOS guided coil and glue this time versus EOS with coils alone. Uh, this is from Ecuador. So you can see the graph here, only coil and then coil and glue. Now these authors found that each of these four categories were statistically uh, significantly in favor of the coil and glue group. So the rebleeding rate was much lower, the varix reappearance rate lower, the reintervention free time was, was significantly longer, and reintervention rate was lower. And this is a meta analysis comparing all studies looking at glue treatment versus EOS guided coil versus EOS guided coil and glue. So 23 studies, 851 patients. And here, the recurrence of gastric varices was significantly lower in the EUS coil and glue group. Late bleeding was numerically lower, but this did not reach statistical significance. Our group has used uh, coil uh, followed by glue 
for primary prophylaxis of gastric variceal bleeding. And in this study of 80 patients with a mean varic size of 22, recurrent bleeding rate was 7.5%, gastric variceal rebleed only 2.5%. Uh, the number needed to treat to prevent one bleed was three. Importantly, the cost was significantly lower if patients underwent prophylactic treatment. So three sessions of endoscopy was one half the cost of hospitalization if patients bled. Before ending, I'd like to bring your attention to this AGA clinical practice update on the management of bleeding gastric varices from 2021. And what's interesting is best pra practice advice number 10, which states when gastrorenal shunts uh, are present and local expertise is available, Berto is the optimal endovascular therapy. So this guideline is advocating Berto really as the first choice if a gastrorenal shunt is present. So the role of endoscopic treatment has been relegated to confirmation of successful Berto obliteration of gastric varices and to monitor the patients for the possibility of uh, new or worsening esophageal uh, varices. So they've taken endoscopic treatment out of the equation, out of the guidelines, if a gastrorenal shunt is present. But what is noteworthy is that EOS-guided treatment of gastric varices is not included in this updated uh, review. And admittedly, it's still early days, uh, but I think before we reach a conclusion like this, we need to look at the outcomes using EUS guided strategies. And you see this uh, algorithm here, which reflects this recommendation. So if a gastrorenal shunt is present, type 2B or type 3B, Berto is the treatment of choice. And then subsequent band ligation plus minus tips if esophageal varices form or worsen. There are many open questions. Should EUS guided treatment replace the historic endoscopy guided? Should it be monotherapy versus hybrid, glue alone or adding coils before glue injection? And which glue should we use? Should we target the feeder vessel or the varix or both? And what type of surveillance protocol should we use? And should it include EUS and what should the intervals be? Takeaway? Glue injection is the treatment of choice for bleeding gastric varices. Now that is undisputed, and that's in all of the guidelines. Junctional and fundic varices differ in morphology, pathophysiology, natural history, and response to endoscopic uh, treatment. So we really need to differentiate the two. The challenge of treating fundic varices is the high flow in these gastrorenal shunts, which nearly all patients with fundic varices have, drains into the IVC, and therefore the high risk of systemic embolization. And that is after all the reason why the radiologists perform Berto when they perform their, their embolization treatment. The EUS guided strategies were developed to reduce this risk, but it remains to be seen whether they uh, truly do, but the data so far suggests that it does. And what we await, and I think really need now, is to compare EUS guided strategies to Berto, because the message is getting out there now that a patient with fundic varices and a gastrorenal shunt should go right to Berto. And I'm not sure that that's warranted yet. Thank you.